Hey, good morning, everyone. Let's grab our seats. Let's kind of settle in here. Thanks for that courtesy wave there, uh, Chris. To my good morning, Chris waves. All right. You know what? We prayed last night for just good weather this morning. Got the God would part the skies. And, uh, you know, it's going to rain later today, but not during church. Yay. Yeah, it's going to be great. And it's so much warmer today than what my wife expected. She was looking, she's bringing blankets. She brought comforters and all that. I brought, I brought my down jacket, yeah. <laughs> anyway, let's go ahead and pray, and we'll, uh, we'll just begin to worship the Lord. Uh, communion will be open when you're ready to come up and grab communion, take it back to your seat, and just spend time with the Lord and receive uh, the body and the blood this morning. Reflect on the sacrifice. Let's pray. Father God, we just, again, so wonderfully blessed, Lord, that you would consider us, Lord. I, I just think of David, that what is man that you would consider us, Lord? Who am I that you would consider me? Lord, and your, your love so great, your grace greater than all our sins, Lord. We just... We just want to praise you this morning. We want to thank you this morning. We want to lift our voices to you and, and just sit in your presence, Lord. We want to bless you with our, with our songs. And, Lord, so would you receive our worship this morning, Lord? Would you be blessed from our heart to yours as we express our thanksgiving, Lord? We give you praise and glory, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand. How fun to see everybody out here. <laughs> Sing a song of praise to the Lord. Strength arises, we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God. The everlasting God. You do not you won't grow weary. You're the defender of the weak. You comfort those in need. You lift us up on wings like eagles. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God. The everlasting God. You do not think you won't. keyboard actually this week though the joys of being outside <laughs> <laughs>
if you'd like. And don't forget about communion up here.
Jesus, you are fairer than all that we see, all, all that exists, certainly fairer than us, Lord, and we are just so grateful for your, your great love for us, Lord, what you did on the cross and how we can bow before you and worship you today. I just ask you to, um, Lord, just pierce us with that, as the sword of your word, Lord, as Pastor Gary brings it to us, and let it change us today. In your name, Jesus, amen. All right, a couple announcements. Maybe by uh, we go through the announcements, you can open your Bibles. We'll be in Matthew chapter 13. So Tuesday, uh, this Tuesday, 5.30 at the Garbarino's house, we meet for the Revelation study. Uh, Acts 2.42 talks about continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, and prayers, breaking of bread and fellowship. And that's what we're doing on Tuesday uh, nights. We have a meal together. We fellowship. We just enjoy each other. And then we turn to the Word and just dig into the book of Revelation. We'll be in uh, chapter 9 this uh, Tuesday. So I invite you out. I encourage you to come. It's just a great time. You know, honestly, uh, just comes into my mind right now, so I'm going to say it. You know, a lot of people talk about, you know, friendships that they've had over the years within this church, and now the church is kind of, you know, uh, has splintered and gone in different directions. You know, and now's the time to invest in new friendships. Come out to uh, Tuesday night and just develop new friendships. Come out uh, on Thursday, more, uh, Thursday evenings when we uh, return to Thursday evening Bible study. Come out to the men's group. Come out to the women's group. Come out to, um, you know, all the various studies, the prayer meetings. And, and, you know, invest in new friendships. Develop new friendships. Go deep with new friendships. And, uh, you know, so I just really want to encourage you with that word. Uh, Saturday night's underground prayer. Last night was just another great night of prayer. You know, some... Some nights, you know, uh, you start praying and, and uh, you know, you look at your clock and you say, wow, it's just been a half an hour. You know, I thought it's been longer than that. But then there are nights like last night where you start praying, you look at your clock and you're like, D it's over. It's, it's time to leave. It's getting late. You know, just the prayer has just been so sweet. So I just want to encourage you to come out to prayer too. The quote that uh, I ran across this uh, last week, and, and uh, I actually texted it to Jill for the uh, e-bulletin. Earlier than Norm, I fell in love with this quote. More potent, more powerful than all the dark and mighty powers let loose in the world, more powerful than anything else is the power of prayer set ablaze by the fire of God cast upon the earth. And uh, boy, that's just true, you know. The weapon that we have, it talks about the armor of God in Ephesians. And prayer and the word of God, those are offensive weapons. You know, the rest of them are defensive weapons, you know. The shield of faith, the belt of uh, truth, you know. Uh, sorry, the belt of righteousness. You know what I'm talking about. There are defensive things, you know, but the word and the the prayer, those are offensive weapons that we have. And boy, you know what? We want to wield them on behalf of the church, wield them on behalf of the ministries that we are engaged in, wield them on behalf of uh, the body, but also on behalf of this town, praying that God would just reach out and grab hearts for him in these uh, final days. I want to let you know, too, June 8th, Tuesday, beginning June 8th, at 10 a.m., 
Do we know where we're meeting? Not yet? Oh, yeah. We're going to be meeting someplace, not we, but the ladies, Tuesday, June 8th, 10 a.m., uh, ladies' book study for the summer. Uh, Tina's going to be leading through that. And you know what? Tina does such a good job with these book studies. But the book they're going to be looking at is uh, The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer. And you know, honestly, I think it's chapter 2 in that book. Uh, the Blessedness of Possessing Nothing, I think, is the title of that chapter. Tozer wrote it when his daughter was dying. And you know what? It's probably one of the greatest chapters in print. And so I encourage you, connect with that. You're going to want to order that uh, online, you know, however you get it, Kindle, uh, audio book, whatever, paperback, whatever uh, you get, you're going to want to order that. Uh, and they'll, uh, you read through, you discuss chapters one and two when they meet uh, the first time. Um, next, me next week, this is not right. It says right here, next week, where are we meeting? Question mark. Like I know. I was going to ask you, Dennis, where are we meeting next week? You know, it looks like, uh, yeah, right here, it looks like what's going on with the space is if you're following the news, materials are difficult to get. People make more money on unemployment right now than actually working. So they're having a hard time finding laborers to build out our space. And so next week, actually, it's glorious. I don't know. Did you guys notice the bird up here while we were singing? You know what? That is so right. Just... God's creation, worshiping the Lord with us. I thought it was awesome. And uh, I love being in the park. But anyway, we'll be here next week. Do be praying. Continue to pray for our space and the building out of our space. And uh, so, oh, one other uh, announcement. You know the property the church used to have down on 89? Well, the property no longer belongs to the church. That's closed. And the check has cleared the bank. And so, you know, uh, you know, God's moving in a neat way. God's doing. God's providing for us as a church. And I just want to encourage you. Boy, the future is bright for Calvary Chapel Truckee. And, uh, you know, we're, our heart is to take that money, purchase a piece of property in time, wait on the Lord to give us a, the right piece of property, build a, a permanent home for us, where, you know, we don't have to meet in the park, but uh, we can if we want to, those kinds of things. So do be in prayer for God's provision and direction in regards to purchasing a piece of property and building a church. Um, tithe box is located right behind the camera uh, next to Tammy to receive this morning tithes and offerings. And uh, we'll go ahead and open up now with a word of prayer and begin our study. As soon as I find out why my iPad went off. There we go. Father God, we do thank you so much for your great love towards us. Lord, and argu arguably probably the greatest gift you've given us is the Word of God. Apart from it, we wouldn't know about the salvation that was available to us, Lord. Apart from it, we wouldn't know your heart for us, the extents that you went to to save us. And Lord, we just, we just want to open your Word now and ask that you would just wash over us and open our eyes to just wonderful things found in your word. The section of scripture we're looking at to this morning, would you just speak to each one of our hearts, Lord? I pray that when we leave here this morning, everyone would understand, know, and personally experience that they've been in your presence this morning. Lord, speak to us now. Our ears are open. Our hearts are ready to receive. We ask it in your name, Jesus. Amen. So again, Matthew chapter 13 is where we're at this morning. If you have your Bibles open, we'll be 
picking up our reading in uh, verse 43. And we will read to the end of the chapter. Matthew 13, verse, actually we start in verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven, Jesus is talking, again the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid. And for the joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and, and buys that field. Verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a, a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore. And they sat down and gathered the good into vessels and threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said to them, speaking of the disciples, Have you understood all these things? And they said to him, Yes, Lord. And then he said to them, Therefore, every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasures things new and old. Now it came to pass, when Jesus had finished these parables, that he departed from there. When he'd come into his own country, he taught um, them in their synagogue, so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers, James, Joses, Simons, and, and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where did this man get all these things? So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. Now he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. You know, I'd like to welcome you here this morning. If you're watching online, I'd like to welcome you. If you're new to us this morning, uh, on Sunday mornings we've been studying through the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, we love the Lord so much. You know, we want to know everything we can about Him. We want to know every, about everything that He did. We want to hear everything He has to say. And because everything Jesus did and said is worthy of our full attention, that's why we seek to go through the Word and just learn everything we can. We go through the word verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, through the entire uh, Bible. And my prayer for us this morning, my prayer for us is that Jesus would have our full attention this morning and that our hearts would be open to whatever He wishes to say to us this Sunday morning. Matthew chapter 13 is probably one of the most famous chapters in all of the Bible. When people become aware of the contents of Matthew chapter 13, they'll often refer to it as that parable chapter. Matthew 13 records what is known as the seven kingdom parables. And Jesus spoke these to his disciples. And each of these parables are introduced by Jesus by the same phrase. And that phrase is, the kingdom of heaven is like. right? And again, I want to remind you real quick um, what a parable is. We get our English word parable from two Greek words. Para, meaning alongside, and balos, meaning to throw. right? So the word parable, it means to throw alongside. So what Jesus is doing using the parabolic method of teaching is he's taking something that is physical, a physical something which the people are very familiar with and he uh, throws it alongside a spiritual truth. 
that is less familiar to them. And the intent is that they might gain an understanding of that spiritual truth that Jesus is trying to communicate to them, right? So, you know, most people we think in pictures. And so a parable, an illustration, you know, it really helps us to get that light to turn on, right? So we can gain an understanding of what's being communicated. Now, Jesus is using very well-known, very familiar imagery in these kingdom parables. And he throws it alongside what he wants us to understand. And what he wants us to understand in these parables, what he wants us to understand this morning is, is this thing called the kingdom of heaven. So that raises a question for us. What is the kingdom of heaven? And again, in Matthew's gospel, not necessarily in the other gospels, but in Matthew's gospel, when Matthew speaks of the kingdom of God, it means one thing. And when he speaks of the kingdom of heaven, it means something completely different, right? When we read these phrases in Matthew's gospel, we can be tempted to think that they, they mean the same thing, but they don't. Not in Matthew's gospel, right? In Matthew's gospel, when he uses the phrase, the kingdom of God, it always refers to Christians, right? It always is used in reference to believers, right? No one else. But when Matthew uses the phrase, the kingdom of heaven, it refers to those who are Christians, and also it includes those who are lost, those that don't know Christ. It speaks of those who generally know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, as well as those who give the appearance of knowing the Lord, but they don't, right? Like the religious leaders of Jesus' day, they would be the classic example of this, right? They looked like they were interested in what Jesus was teaching. You know, they wanted to look like sincere listeners to what Jesus was saying, but they weren't, right? In fact, at this point in time, they're already plotting Jesus' death. So that's what, Jesus is, that's what Jesus means when he says the kingdom of heaven. Those that are genuinely saved and those that give the appearance of being a follower of Jesus, right? Now, there's this big mix of people who are following Jesus at this time. There are a lot of people who are in this mix. They're interested. Most people are interested in the, the kingdom of heaven. They're interested in heaven. They're interested in what Jesus has to say about heaven. You know, there, there are people in this mix that, you know, they would like to end up in heaven, you know. And that's the kind of crowd that's gathered around Jesus at this point in time. Some who are true seekers and some who are just trying to find fault with him, right? Still others are in this mix of people that, you know, they're not really interested in anything other than seeing, hopefully, we're going to get to see a miracle. And so that's what they're about. Now, at the point of our study this morning, we've already been through four of the seven kingdom parables in Matthew chapter 13. The first one, the parable of the sower. The second one was the parable of the wheat and tares. The third, the parable of the mustard seed. And the fourth, the parable of the leaven. And this morning we come to the final three parables. And these three final parables cover three more things that Jesus wants us to be aware of in our desire to walk with him, in our desire to serve him. Things that we need to be aware of and our desire to be a witness to him in this world, right? One of the things that makes these three final parables different than the first four is in these three parables, Jesus speaks only to believers. 
the first four were spoken to that mixed multitude that was gathered all around Jesus. But these last three are only spoken to the disciples. And the first of the remaining three parables is called the parable of the hidden treasure. Jesus says, verse 44, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field. So to me, this parable starts out right. I mean, everyone enjoys the story about finding buried treasure. I mean, what little boy doesn't spend time looking for hidden treasure? You know, what little boy, after hearing that there's a pot of gold at the end of a rainbow, doesn't attempt to find out if it's true or not? And after many years of searching, I can confidently report to you it's not true. There's not a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, right? There's no treasure at the end of that rainbow. Anyway, Jesus says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. And for the joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Now, the common interpretation of this parable, and maybe you've been taught this or you heard that it was taught this way, but the common interpretation is that the man represents sinners. The treasure represents Jesus. And we need to give up everything we have in order to gain Jesus, in order to gain salvation. Now, that cannot be the interpretation of this parable because it violates everything the Bible has to say about salvation, right? The Bible teaches that salvation is a free gift from God. You know, Jesus and the salvation that is found in him is not for sale. Salvation isn't something you can earn or buy from him for any amount of money, right? If we pulled all of our resources, if we pulled everything that we possess, all of our wealth, and we piled it up right here in front of me, you know what? That wouldn't be enough to buy one person's salvation, right? So that can't be the interpretation of this parable. Paul wrote to the churches at Ephesus and said, for by grace, and grace is a gift word, right? It means unmerited, unearned favor, given freely. It's not earned. Paul said, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Paul also wrote to Titus, saying, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. The proper interpretation of this parable, it becomes clear when we use the key to understanding all the parables that Jesus gave to us. The key to correctly understanding all the parables is the parable of the sower. Jesus said to his disciples concerning that parable, Mark 4.13, he said, do you understand this parable? How then, or, uh, sorry, he says, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The parable of sowers is the key to understanding the parables. So when we come to a parable where Jesus doesn't identify for us what each of the elements of the parable means, Right? We need to go back to the parable of the sowers to see what that element uh, referred to there. Right, So then we can safely carry that meaning of that element to the parable that we're looking at and, and give it the same meaning. And if we do that, we can be assured that we'll be on solid ground as we attempt to interpret the new parable we're looking at. So as we look at the parable of the hidden treasures, since the man in the parable of the sower represented Jesus, 
You know what? It has to represent him here also, right? Since the field represented the world in the parable of the sower, it needs to represent the world in this parable also. And what is the treasure which Jesus gave all to purchase the world in order to get? Well, it's the church. It's you and it's me. You know what? It's Christians. Everywhere you look in the New Testament, the church is spoken of as a purchased possession. The church is referred to as redeemed. You know, and redeemed, that's a purchased word, right? Paul writes to the Ephesians, he says to the Ephesians elders, uh, Acts chapter 20, he says, Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore take heed to yourself and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Ephesians chapter 1, Paul said, In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, saying, For we were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Right? Now, we see the purchased possession is us, the church. Now we want to take notice of the price that Jesus paid to purchase us, to save us. Jesus tells us in his own words here in this parable that he gave all, right, that he had. All that he had in order that we might be saved. Just think about that for a minute. Think about what he gave up in order for you and I to know him, in order for you and I to be saved, right? One of the things that constitutes all that he had was a willingness to leave the glory of heaven behind. He was willing to leave the indescribable glory of heaven in order to step down into this world, to come into this fallen world. I mean, it's unimaginable. It's unthinkable. He was willing to leave communion with the Father, the worship of the angels, the glory he had from all eternity past. He was willing to leave all of heaven behind in order to come to this world to save me and to save you. It's overwhelming. It's incomprehensible in my mind. That alone was a significant price to pay, right? To leave the glory of heaven to come to this fallen world. And we haven't yet begun to mention the suffering of the cross yet, right? It's already so humbling to think about what he was willing to do that I might be saved, that you might be saved. He was willing to do what he was willing to pay, you know, in order to save us. I mean, it's just mind-blowing. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth and told them of a man, again, probably referring to himself, who was raised up into the third heaven. And Paul said it would be unlawful it would be a crime, right, to even try to put into words the things he heard there. They were so wonderful, it was so amazing, right? Paul said, I can't begin to explain to you what I heard. Using human language would be an injustice to describe what I heard. Forget about the things that I saw, right? The words would mar the reality, 
it would be a disservice to you to attempt to tell you about it would deface it, right? That's what Paul had to say about heaven and its glory. This place where Jesus was willing to leave, this place where he came from in order to save us. Jesus said in John 17, 24, in his high priestly prayer, he said, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me, again, speaking of the disciples, but it's also speaking of every one of us here. He said, Father, I desire that, that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. In other words, Jesus prayed to the Father, saying, Father, I long for the day that those you gave me would see the glory that I had come from, right, before I came to the earth. Peter, James, and John, they, they got a glimpse of that glory there on the Mount of Transfiguration where they saw Jesus transfigured. And it says his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light, right? Paul probably had this in mind when he wrote to the church in Corinth saying, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. All, all of us need to understand, I think, one day, one day we're going to stand before the Lord on that glassy sea in heaven and we're going to see with our own eyes what it was that he left behind to come to this world in order to save us well the second part of all that he had includes his physical death upon the cross right this is how paul put it philippians chapter 2 let this mind be in you which was in christ jesus who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And, and that's, that's what we just uh, were speaking about. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Though all that he had also includes the fact, uh, not only includes the fact that he was willing to suffer the brutality of the cross, but he was also willing to bear our sins, to bear your sins and the sins of the world. Every one of my sins was heaped upon Jesus there at the cross. Right? He bore every single sin in human history there upon the cross. And when he bore our sins for those hours, it's a mystery. We can't fully understand it or comprehend it. It's a mystery. But something happened during those hours which never happened before in the history and will never happen again. What happened during those hours is a mystery to us. And, you know, all we know is what Jesus communicated there upon the cross. Eli, Eli, Sama, uh, Sabak, Sabak, ah. I did pretty good earlier when I was practicing. Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? all in order to save us. He gave up all that he had in order to save us. The price he was willing to pay. Again, it's unimaginable. It's incomprehensible. It's a mystery beyond our understanding. You have to ask yourself, why? Why would he be willing to do all of this? Well, again, the parable tells us why. 
for the joy over all the treasure. Right? Why, why would he put up with the aggravation that we saw the previous four parables that we looked at in the, over the last few weeks? All the disrespect of men and women towards his word, the careless hearing of his word, the hard hearts, the blasphemy, all the rejection, the false accusation and the misrepresentations. You know, one of the most hurtful things that can happen in life is for someone to stand up and misrepresent what you've said. Misrepresent, you know, what you're all about. Misrepresent your character. You know, and that happens all day, every day to Jesus in this world. And yet he endures it. The rejection of his creation. The rejection of men and women he created. Why? Why would he endure all that aggravation? Why would he put up with all of it? And again, the parable tells us, for the joy of saving you. Just stop and think about that for a moment. The key word in the phrase, the key word in this parable, I think, is the word joy. You know, just try to absorb that into your spirit for a minute. Just let that be a Selah moment for you. You know, we think about the joy that His salvation has brought into our lives. But here Jesus tells us of the joy our salvation brings to Him. You know, honestly, if it wasn't Jesus telling us this, you know, I don't think I would believe it. I don't think I could believe it. You think about God for a bit. And you think about how He created the heavens and the earth with just a word. He created everything around us. All that we see and we enjoy on a daily basis. You know, you think about different systems He created. You know, the, the way the weather patterns work. You know, the laws of physics, the laws of nature. You think about, you know, the planets and the stars and the universe, right? How we are fearfully and wonderfully made. All of it speaks of God's design and God's power. It speaks of His wisdom and His ability. But it doesn't speak to us of His heart as fully as He would want to express it. Right? How does God get the opportunity to express the greatness of His heart, the greatness of His love, except in sending His Son to die on the cross to provide salvation for someone like me, someone like you. The joy that He experiences to save us from the penalty of our sin, the hell we deserve to save us from the power of sin in our daily lives, to make us a free people, to save us from the very presence of sin, which we will fully experience in heaven. And do you understand that? The day is coming where you'll never again be tempted to sin without the opportunity to do that. In all the mystery of human history and what God is in His foreknowledge, the beauty and the greatness of his heart and his love, the joy that comes from the salvation of a sinner, it would be completely unknown to us. We would look around and gain a pre an appreciation for his wisdom and his power, but we would know nothing of his great love. It was the joy that he experienced in providing us with salvation that allows us to see the heart of God as fully as we can, this side of heaven, the heart of love that He has. You know what? Jesus, He really, really is the lover of our soul, right? 
He was the lover of our souls long before we became a lover of our souls. You know, I was careless with my soul for many, many years. You know what? I was stupid in regards to my soul. I never gave any thought to my soul. You know, I was willing to give it to anything and to everything, regardless of the damage that it would bring into my life. Jesus never gave up on me. And you know, he's never given up on you either. He's placed a value on our soul when for years we didn't value our souls at all. And that's the way that he is. That's the kind of God he is. He is the lover of our soul. The writer of the book of Hebrews says this, Hebrews 12, 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and having sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. When Jesus hung there on the cross, he wasn't saying to himself, this is such a great day. I'm having the time of my life. Woohoo! That's not what he was saying. You know what? To the contrary, he endured the cross. It's talking about a physical enduring of the cross. The pain and the suffering. And we can't even begin to, uh, to imagine. We can't begin to fathom what was going on mentally and emotionally. But we're told he despised the shame of that cross. You know, it wasn't just a good man on that cross. It wasn't just a perfect man on that cross. It was the God man upon that cross. It was God in human flesh. It was deity enrobed in humanity upon that cross. It was the creator of every single human being on that cross. And to be left in that immodest and tortured condition, crucified by his own creation for no good reason, and yet he endured it. Why? For the joy that filled his heart to save you and to provide salvation for all mankind. The joy that our salvation produced in him. I'm floored just by the thought of it. I mean, it's too much to take in. And the question that must be asked is, Am I going to rob him of that joy? Will I rob him? Will you rob him of the joy of being the Lord and master of your life? This parable speaks of the love that Jesus has for you, for me, for the whole world. It speaks of his special love that he has for those who place their faith in him. It also lets us gain an idea of how he thinks of us, right? He views us, he views you, he views me as treasure worth giving up everything for. He loves us because he is love, not because we're lovable. <laughs> Apart from the value he places on me, I am of no value. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, Nothing good dwells. It all speaks of how wonderful He is. Jesus didn't just speak of His love for us in this parable. You know what? He demonstrated it. He demonstrated it not only by coming to this falling world, but by dying on the cross for our sins while we were enemies of God living in rebellion to Him. And you need to know, you need to know he demonstrated his love for you and for me by taking our sins and dying on the cross. You need to know he didn't do it begrudgingly. He didn't do it out of some sense of duty. 
but He did it because of His love for you. He did it for the joy that it produced in Him. There was deep, deep emotion behind the purchase of our souls. When you surrender your heart and life to Jesus, you've done the single greatest thing you can do to bless Jesus and bless the Father. Right? And that is placing your faith in Jesus for salvation. We can often think, you know, it's just a small thing, you know? We realize that we're the recipients of so much when we do that. But in the eyes of heaven, we don't fully understand how huge it is. From heaven's perspective, when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, it causes heaven to rejoice. In placing our faith in Christ, we're not only blessing ourselves, but the parable teaches us that we're blessing the heart of Jesus. And it's just so amazing to understand. The next parable is the parable of the, the pearl of great price. Verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls. And when he had found one pearl of great pot price, went out and sold all that he had and bought it. Now, the details of this parable is that there's a merchant who's seeking beautiful pearls. He finds a pearl of great price. It means that it's a pearl of tremendous value. It's the pearl to beat all pearls. So what does he do? He gives all that he has that he might purchase that pearl. Again, the common interpretation of this parable is that the pearl represents Jesus, you know, and his salvation, and we need to give up all that we have no matter how valuable, in order to gain salvation from Jesus. But as we discussed earlier, that goes against everything the Bible has to say about salvation. You know, salvation is a free gift. There's no amount of money that could, could uh, be offered to buy your salvation. You know, it would be like someone offering to give you a mansion on Lake Tahoe with, I don't know, a half a mile of shoreline, you know, just a big spread. And you say to them, you know, I, I can't accept that. Please let me pay for that. And what do you do is you slip a dollar to them in a handshake, right? And, uh, you know, they would be insulted by that. Do you think you could buy this mansion for a dollar? I mean, Accept it or don't accept it. Receive it as a gift or don't receive it. But don't insult me by thinking you could purchase this gift with a dollar. Thinking that you could do anything at all to earn or purchase salvation, it's an insult to God. The proper interpretation is that the merchant man is Jesus and the pearl represents you and I. It represents Christians. It represents the church in this fallen world. This kingdom of heaven where it can be very difficult to discern between the true and the false believers. This parable speaks of the same price that Jesus was willing to pay for the pearl that he was willing to pay for the treasure hidden in the field, the, the price to purchase the field to gain the treasure. He gave all that he had to redeem the church, to bring us into his family, and to express his love towards us. Now, please, listen carefully. This parable teaches basically the same thing that the parable of the hidden treasure teaches with one big difference. In the parable of the hidden treasure, the kingdom of heaven is likened to the treasure. In other words, the emphasis is on the treasure, right? It's on the redeemed. But in the parable of the pearl of the great price, 
the kingdom of heaven is likened to the merchant. Right? In other words, the par- in this parable, the merchant is the focus. The great emphasis is on him. It's on the Redeemer. What I think the Lord is trying to communicate to us here is that the pearl is, is in no danger of being overlooked, of being lost in this age of spiritual duplicity, in this age of spiritual confusion, in this age of spiritual counterfeits. Our Lord is a master merchant, right? He knows how to discern between uh, the genuine and the false. And there's no way he's going to overlook even the least of the saints that make up the pearl of great price. You and I are not going to get lost in the chaos and the mess of this world. What looks like confusion to all of us is not confusing to our master. He sees. I think it's all summed up in what Paul wrote to his young protege, Timothy. 2 Timothy 2.19, he says, The Lord knows those who are His. He knows who are His, right? And who are not His, right? And if you've surrendered your life to Christ, then you're His. You're His possession. You don't have to worry. Personally, I take comfort in that thought right? He knows those who are His. And it feels good to know that I'm His. It feels good, doesn't it? In spite of all of Satan's counterfeits, all the tares among the wheats, you know, in the middle of such compromise within what calls itself Christianity today, all the false doctrine and the like, that we've talked about in the earlier parables. Jesus has his eyes on the church and he knows and he sees every person that makes up the church. He knows those who are his, right? That's something we should rest in in the middle of this crazy world. And that's the intention of this parable, that we would rest in him as a result of understanding this parable. In verse 47 through 50, we have the parable of the dragnet. Verse 47 says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet. Now, for you older folks, Jesus is not talking about a TV show here, right? You know, don't think Jesus is talking about Joe Friday saying, Just the facts. Just the facts, ma'am. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. Now the imagery Jesus is using is that of a dragnet. And a dragnet is just that. It was a net that they drug, right? They would place this net between two boats It was weighted on the bottom, and then it was drug along. And as the two boats headed for the shore, you know, the net would just uh, corral everything that was in its path, right? Good fish and bad fish, fish that were useful, fish that weren't. Every kind of thing that was in the Sea of Galilee, including boots, we're told that when they got to shore, Then they would separate the fish, right? The good from the bad. There'd be big vessels of water that they'd throw the good fish in to keep them alive so they could sell them as fresh in the marketplace. But the bad fish, they just threw away, right? The imagery Jesus is using in this parable is, again, very, very familiar to the people. And Jesus gives us the interpretation of the parable Verse 49 through 50. So it was at the end of the age, the angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Just as the dragnet 
drugging good and bad fish, so too, when we throw out the net of the gospel, it's going to pull in all kinds of people, right? Some good and sincere, you know, some faults just trying to appear like, you know, believers, followers of Christ, and some that are just evil. But at the end of the age, Jesus is saying a judgment is coming, which he will oversee as the angels separate those that are wicked from the just. At that time, the wicked will be cast into a furnace of fire. Speaking of Gehenna, the eternal lake of fire. And Jesus says, at that time there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Again, the wailing speaks of emotional anguish of Gehenna, the eternal lake, lake of fire. And personally, I think a big part of that emotional a uh, anguish will be regret, right? The regret of having ended up in hell after rejecting the free gift of salvation, which is available to everyone. And the gnashing of teeth speaks of the physical pain and torment of the eternal lake of fire. I don't want to have anything to do with either of them truthfully and you know what I won't thankfully because Jesus delivers those who have been born again from the wrath to come we're told 1 Thessalonians 1:10 now here's the point of this parable Jesus wants us to know there's that there's a great and final judgment that will occur in human history and he wants us to understand that there's a great and final separation that's going to uh, take place in human history. This mixed kind of living that we, that we are living in in the middle of right now, partly true, partly false, tares among the wheat, people proclaiming they're speaking for God when they're not really speaking for God. One day, all the confusion all the uh, conflicting voices, all the false teachers and false doctrine, all the hypocrisy, all the hard-heartedness, all the tares and the leaven, the bad and the wicked, one day it's all going to come to an end. One day the Lord, once and for all, will separate those who are His from those who are the devil's. One day, all the opposition of the devil, all the devices of the devil will be taken away. There'll be no more mixture. Wickedness is going to be re uh, removed. Righteousness will be revealed and be rewarded. God is going to make all things right one day, one day very soon. Sometimes we just need to remember it, right? We can look at the evil in our world and our country and see how it just seems to be expanding. See how it's infiltrating what is viewed as professing Christianity. And it's easy it's to be tempted to think that evil is just going to wipe out what's good. We can be tempted to think it's going to continue unimpeded and come out on top. Sometimes it can look like evil is going to have the final say in human history and good will be overrun. But it's not true. God is going to take care of everything. He's going to clean it all up in the end. Sometimes it can seem, even in what is called professing Christianity, it can look like faithfulness to the Word of God is being pushed aside and purity of doctrine is being abandoned. The call to, to holy living is not often heard anymore in the church. The truth is we may not even be seeing the worst of it yet. Right? The Bible talks about days that are coming where people will not put up with sound doctrine. 
what they're going to do is heap up for themselves false teachers who will tell them things they want to hear, right? Not what God is saying. Those teachers, you know, they become very popular. They get large crowds following after them. And more and more, these false teachers will be sought after as the return of the Lord draws near. So much of Christianity today in the United States is man-centered instead of Christ-centered. The songs are all about the people and not about God. Much of the service is attempting to bless the people instead of blessing God. Songs are chosen in order to produce an emotional experience in the people with no regard to God or what He wants to hear when the people gather together. The teaching is devoid of any message that God wants directed to the church. Instead, the message is constructed in such a way as not to offend the people, right? But to make them feel good. Much of the church today is what I call me church. It's all about me. Don't offend me. Don't challenge me. Don't say anything that will cause me to focus on something other than an I, me, my attitude. That's the only trinity that I'm interested in, in hearing about. It's all about me. Churches today cause people to become very familiar with their situation, their feelings, their problems, their needs. They focus on everything but God and what He wants from His people. And this is the worst time in the world for that kind of thing to be happening in the church. right? The reason why is the Bible tells us as the days draw closer to Jesus' return, the world is just going to get worse and worse. And we're going to need a solid foundation in God like we've never had before. What's happening in the church today is so dangerous It's drawing people away. When we hear a message in church or on the radio, we need to ask ourselves, is this a sermon about God supremely and me secondarily? Is this a message all about glorifying God or is all about pleasing me so I'll come back next week? You know what? We need to be alert. We need to be wise. I love God's Word. and I love the church. I I don't talk about stuff like this a lot. But as your pastor, I need to warn you and help you understand the times we're living in. We need to be constantly growing in our knowledge of God, in our understanding and appreciation of Him and our understanding and appreciation of the Word of God. We can't worship and trust in Him whom we do not know. And that's why as the days grow darker, we need to press in with a greater resolve to know God and to give ourselves completely to Him. As our world and country runs further and faster away from God, Christians will begin to face greater and greater persecution. And as it begins, and it has begun, as it begins, that's not the time to look for a foundation in God which was never laid before. We need to purpose in our hearts today to live for Him with all of our heart mind, soul, and strength. Today is not the time to live a compromising life. Some of you are happy to hear that, and maybe some of you are not. You know, I've said it. I'm not ashamed of that. The main thing this parable of the dragnet teaches us is that God wins, right? God is completely of what's go- uh, completely aware of what's going on all around us today, and He will take care of it. And on that final day, 
will ha- he'll have the final say related to everything. It's good to know that. It's good to re- be reminded of it, to hear it. And Jesus knows we need it. And so he reminds us. Now, having finished the parables, Jesus gives the disciples kind of an application. Verses 51 and 52. Jesus said to them, Have you understood all these things? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Sometimes people kind of make fun of the disciples thinking that they're just bluffing here, right? That they don't really understand. But I don't think... You know, Jesus would have continued. I think Jesus understands the disciples, what they understand, what they don't understand. And because they actually do understand what he's saying, then he continues. He said to them, verse 52, Therefore, every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who uh, brings out of his treasures things new and old. Jesus goes on to tell them of the responsibility that goes along with understanding all of these parables that he had just spoken to them. The disciples, having a firm grasp of all these parables, Jesus now likens to uh, a scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven. The disciples were fairly well versed in the Old Testament. And here Jesus is kind of giving them new revelation of the new covenant And Jesus gives them this illustration of a householder. In those days, and I suppose even today, a wealthy person who owns a house often has so much stuff, they can't put it all into the house, so they have it in storage, right? A lot of stuff in storage. And they go to their stores and they'll pull out this old thing and they'll match it with a new thing and decorate their house. And that's what... Jesus is talking about when he says he brings out of his treasures things new and old, right? It reminds me of what designers do. It reminds me of what Tina's doing in our house right now, right? They mix and match antique furniture with contemporary furniture to make the house look uh, beautiful, you know? All of it complementing each other for just the right look. It presents very nicely and very beautifully, And what Jesus is telling them is that now the disciples have something. You know, in any conversation they get into regarding Jesus, you guys know the Old Testament and you have a solid foundation of the things there that are true. And you know the new now and also have an understanding of it. You guys are the only ones that know these things. Now put them together and build a beautiful house. Now you have a responsibility as a scribe instructed in the kingdom of heaven to take the old things, right, and to mix them with new things and share them with others. The old and the new are complementary. They're not contradictory to one another. Now don't keep it to yourself. Share it. Share these things with others in a way that's edifying and a blessing to other people. Those of us that know these things have a responsibility to share these things with others. And in verse uh, 53, uh, Matthew continues, Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these parables that he departed from there. When he had come to his own country, that is Nazareth, where he had been raised and worked as a carpenter, when he had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue. So they were astonished and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Jesus, he goes back home. Everybody knows him. And there's a gigantic crowd that's following him. He's doing all kinds of miracles. And he comes into the synagogue. And they're just astonished at his teaching, right? They're marveling at the miracles that he's doing. They're listening to him, and they're amazed at seeing what it is that he's doing. And then it's like a dark cloud comes over everything, and they say, verse 55, 
Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers, James, Joses, Simon, and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where did this man get these things? Isn't this Joseph's boy? You know? Didn't he grow up in our midst? Where did he get this stuff? He didn't get this stuff in Nazareth. I know that for sure. Verse 57, So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country and his own house. Now, he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Jesus comes back to his hometown. He's the talk of the town. He demonstrates his wisdom and, and power in their synagogue. And they have completely, you know, the appropriate reaction. They're just amazed at everything he says and does. But at the same time, they're offended. It raises the question, what is it about Jesus that could possibly be offensive? What could possibly offend them in light of his life, in light of his teaching, in light of the miracles? We're told in the passage what it was that offended them. It was their familiarity with him. They thought they knew all about him. They rejected him because they felt that they knew him. They said, hey, we know who his father is, you know, Joseph the carpenter. We know his mom and his siblings. They're nothing special, right? He can't be great either. We watched this kid grow up. He grew up in this town. And it was because they thought they knew Jesus that they rejected him. Because of their knowledge of, of him on a physical level, they made up their minds that he could never be more than what they thought they knew about him. And this, again, happens all the time to Jesus, even today. People who grow up, especially in the United States of America, which is a country with a Christian heritage, and I'm thankful for that heritage. You know, people that go to church with their folks, you know, maybe they attend Sunday school classes. You know, they've been raised in a Christian home. They've attended youth camps, right? They think they know all about Jesus because they were raised in the church. And so often, that kind of person rejects Jesus, never really knowing him. We say it this way, familiarity breeds contempt. And people miss out on salvation because they think they know all about Jesus when they don't know anything about him at all. You only begin to learn about who and what Jesus is when you give your life to him. When you say yes to him, that's when the doors of your understanding begin to open up. In these seven kingdom parables Jesus gives us in Matthew chapter 13, he gives us seven great truths that he knows that you and I need to know as we walk with him and serve him in this world in order to maintain a proper perspective in this world. The parable of the sower teaches us that not every crowd surrounding Jesus is what it appears to be. There are hard-hearted hearers. There are shallow-hearted hearers. There are crowded hearts and there are good hearts. Jesus says, I just want to tell you, Crowds that are gathered around me is not always what they seem to be. Secondly, the parable of the wheat and the tares. Jesus warns us of false Christians. Anytime you have a genuine work of God in the church, you can count on the devil trying to disrupt and ruin that work through false Christians, through tares among the wheat. 
The third parable, the parable of the mustard seed, Jesus warns us against false growth. It's a danger when growth becomes a focus of a church at the expense of doctrinal purity and faithfulness to the Word of God. And Jesus says, if you compromise biblical integrity for the sake of growth, you'll just open the door for the devil to join that work and then tear it apart from within. The fourth parable, the parable of the leaven, warns us about false doctrine. Not everyone who claims to be speaking for God actually does. So many people claim to be speaking for God while at the same time they've they violate the Word of God. Satan is hard at work to add false doctrine within the church. The fifth parable, the parable of the hidden treasure, Jesus reminds us of the love that he has for his church. And it's in his grace that he considers us to be a treasure. He tells us that our salvation brings him great joy. How wonderful that is to know. The sixth parable, the parable of the pearl of great price, reminds us of Jesus. He is our master merchant. He knows what is of value and who makes up the pearl. And he will never overlook a single one of us in the middle of all the deceit, the apostasy, and the faults spirituality of this age the seventh parable the parable of the dragnet which teaches us that there is a great and final separation in human history there is a judgment coming and god will have the final say regarding what's good and what's evil and we need to know and we need to be confident in every single one of these things right for us to be everything that Jesus has called us to be between his first coming and his second coming. And after that, when he comes again for his church, then it will just be wonderful. Being in his presence, that's all that will matter. You know this chapter 13, just beautiful, beautiful things from our loving shepherd, from our master to occupy our hearts and our minds as we travel through this life waiting for his return. Let's pray. Father, I just want to, again, thank you for your word. I thank you for, Lord, the patience of your people. We've gone long today. But Lord, I just pray that your word would penetrate our hearts and accomplish that purpose which you've sent it out for that it would edify us, that it would encourage us, that it would exhort us to run after you. Father, and I just pray if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, maybe here living a compromised life, that, Lord, that they would turn to you even now and ask you for forgiveness, to receive salvation, to rededicate themselves afresh to you, to run after you. Lord, and for those that maybe are here that don't know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, all that it takes is humbling your heart, repenting of your sins, asking Him to forgive you of your sins, telling Him that you're sorry for those things that you've done, and asking Him to come into your life and to cleanse you, that you believe He died on the cross for you, and that you believe that He was buried in the third day, resurrected again. And now at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you. If you'll just pray a prayer, something like that, Christ has promised to forgive you of your sins, come into your life, make you a new creation. Lord, we just thank you for your love, your grace. We thank you for salvation and the joy that our salvation brings to you, Lord. We give you praise and glory in your name, Jesus. Amen.